Hey, welcome to the fourth episode of Q&A 10. Had a great discussion with Mike Beck, the founder of AMZ Advisors on managing agencies, getting started on Amazon, growing your audiences, and actually how to deal with a early employee that you might have to terminate. Hope you enjoy. All right, Mike. Hey, I I'm don't know. I, I'm doing really well. I've got a bunch of excited folks who've heard questions for, for us um, to talk through. You game? Awesome. Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, we got a question from Colin in New Mexico who says, and that's to be very appropriate, I'm working with an agency, um, but I'm finding it hard to get results. How do I manage my marketing agency better? Um, is it a low, is it because they're not local? Is it because they're, you know, they're elsewhere? How do I get better results out of them? Well, uh, I guess the real question is, what are you putting into it? Uh, you know, do you expect them to get, to do everything themselves? Uh, do you provide the necessary support? Do they have the necessary budget? Are you trying to micromanage them? I mean, these are all questions that you kind of need to ask yourself. Uh, in my experience, when we have, and this is working with over 500 brands at this point, uh, when we have clients that are micromanaging, it makes it extremely difficult to do our job. What happens yeah. is we end up spending more time answering their questions than we actually do doing the work. And that only has mm -hmm. a negative, uh, creates a negative feedback loop on the results you're gonna get. At the same time, you also gotta make sure that you're giving them budget. If there is no advertising budget, there's no way they're gonna be able to grow, uh, grow your sales. I mean, especially on Amazon, it's pay to play. And if you are not investing the dollars uh, to actually get the visibility and get the sales, you're not gonna get the progress. It's all about building a positive feedback loop in your sales cycle. And that involves investing into the platform. Yeah, I think there's another part, which is also just um, managing your expectations up front. I mean, I can't tell you how many people felt the good feeling of saying, I've got an agency to work on this without actually having done the research to say like, is the thing I'm hiring them for the thing they're really good at, you know, or they're hopefully good, et cetera. And also just even understanding, like, did you do reference call with their customer? Do they work the style that works for you? There's so many flavors of what makes yeah. an agency really work, but also there's so many agencies that you probably don't want to work with. And so I think if you don't do I'll that upfront work, um, you know, you're, you're capped at how much you can do with them. hundred um, percent. And I mean, we have plenty of clients that have come to us from other agencies and we hear like all the nightmares of what's happened. And I think that's the big thing is, uh, expectations, like you said, they will promise you the moon if that's what you tell them you want. So be very specific in what you're looking for and you'll probably get better outcomes uh, because they'll know exactly what to work on. Yeah, and I've, I mean, also upfront, helping them everyone understand what the, what the report card is, yeah. right? I mean, if you're hiring an agency to do good work, it's kind of hard to, st it's pretty, ambiguous to understand like if that's been done or not. I mean, of course, everything's cratered, you know that, but, um, you know, also just saying how, how do we turn things into numbers that we can measure um, and mutually, you know, making sure that that scorecard makes sense. I think that's one of the most helpful ways I've seen on, you know, measuring an agency um, for the work they're doing for you, even if it's simply like, did you get things done on time that I asked you for, you know, did, a survey from the people working there, are they happy to work with this? There's, sometimes you can't just quantify the output, but measure whatever you can. Exactly, yeah. And another way we do this is kind of, uh, we do this as like a small wins. Like what are the small wins? Because a lot of times you don't hear about those and it, it's a measure of performance on what we are accomplishing. And if you're not, it's essentially the same thing as a scorecard. If you're not showing things that you're being successful in, it yeah. doesn't create the right uh, appearance to the client of what's actually going on. Um, let me go to another question. This is from Tammy in Pennsylvania. So totally different. I hired someone two months ago, but now I think I need to fire them. Am I being <laughs> fair moving so quickly? I guess it depends on the reason you think you need to fire them, uh, <laughs> and where they are. Uh, terminations are always a tough one. Um, obviously because there, there's potential legal <laughs> complications as well. Yeah. Uh, you need to make sure you have a justified cause for it. You need to make sure that you've documented uh, something. If it's an agency and you have an agreement, that's a little bit easier than a employee. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you already believe that they're not going to be able to get the results uh, that you were looking for, then it's probably better to just make the cut, make a clean cut, and then start focusing on what you actually need going forward uh, than to try to yeah. hope that they improve. I mean, my general experience is that 
people are who they are. They're not magically going to change. They're not magically going to improve overnight. So uh, hoping that they're going to is probably just going to be wasting your time. You know, I, I, I go as far as saying, you know, if, if it's two months and you're already asking yourself if I need to fire them, you may already have part of the answer. Like, it seems like that's, that's what you have to do. But the question is, you know, how optimistic, how much room do you have to do? You know, do you have to actually remediate the situation? Um, I find that, you know, a lot of people like to say, oh, you know, as soon as someone's not working out well, I need to fire them and then move on. But the problem is that you kind of also have an obligation. Do they, do they know they're not tracking? Like sometimes it's just as simple as have you yeah. had like good candor with them on what's working and not that's low hanging fruit. And then your gut just even after one or two rounds of just telling people says this person's just not right. That's when you make the move. But I think people kind of just close their eyes. They've hired someone, they expect it a lot. And then, um, you not really help them be successful, even in the small amount of time. Right. For sure. And I think that this actually goes back well to the last question, uh, with the agencies is if you're not setting the expectations, if you're not having true feedback on what's working, what's not working, if you just expect this person or this agency to just handle everything without yeah. any input from you, you're setting yourself up for failure. So I, I agree. I think having those feedback sessions, letting them know what the goals are, what you're not happy with right now is really going to show you whether it's going to work out in the long time, long term yeah. or not. Well, I'll flip the script. You know, there's, there's the other situation where someone's clearly not being, like it's unambiguous at this point that they're not doing well and they probably aren't set up to do well in that role that they're in, you know, fault aside, whether you hired them wrong or they, they maybe thought they could do something they couldn't, that doesn't matter. I think once you have that like clear understanding, the most important thing I think is just, you know, be able to move quickly on that for their sake, as well as yours, like people who are in these kind of spiraling environments for too long, it messes, it messes up with their psyche, their ability to feel like they can do good work. They might just be in the wrong role and they just need to be in that next one. The sooner you can help them get to that next one by saying it's just not working, let's call it what it is. And they can iterate on that. Um, it can be, it can be far more impactful than kind of, letting it meander over time and it kind of like burns and erodes confidence. I've seen that kind of people stick around because it's obviously it's safe, but it really, it really messes with someone when they're in a role they're not really good at. Everybody knows it and they don't know what to do. Um, it's a tough, it's a real tough situation when that's the case. It is. Unfortunately, most people have been there before. So, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I got a question. Um, Phil from Illinois. So I run a, Plumbing company in Chicago. I have a YouTube channel with content that I put up every two weeks. I can't seem to get any views. What do I do? <laughs> I like that. uh, that's a um, tough one. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, look, I'll, I'll just kick it off. I think the, yeah, the, yeah, go the for first, it. I think the first question is, um, you have to just audit yourself, right? If you're hating putting content up, and you're doing because someone told you to, and it's just like pulling teeth. People will, I mean, people will not feel good watching that kind of content, right? If it's, um, so, you know, if you can't get like oh, a, a meaningful viewer, you get to say like, am I the right person to be doing these kind of things in a public way? It's not for everybody. Like a lot of people don't like that situation. Um, but I think the next one is, you know, there, there are so like infinity channels where you can go look at people in the trades and, and plumbing who are getting that. What are they doing that you're not? What can you study from what's working? You don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think you, you kind of have to say like, what can I learn and iterate? You know, by the way, I, I would actually even say that put out content every two weeks is probably not nearly enough. You need at that. It's like content every day. And then out of the 20 things you put out, one of them pop and then just make more of those and, until you kind of can't get any more views on that type of content anymore and just move on and on and on over and over. Um, there's so many levers that you can pull before you decide, you know, do I, am I just doing the wrong thing? Yeah. And I mean, I, I completely agree with this. I'm big on content creation, and content marketing. And I mean, YouTube is a platform. You can try to game the system with SEO and, and whatever to get more visibility, but you're right. If you're not creating good content that people care about, it's not gonna matter. And you also need to think about just where your audience is. Maybe they're not going to YouTube. Uh, I, mean, I guess for plumbing, I, I would assume people have questions and they're looking for it, but <laughs> there might be other platforms uh, that they're more present on. Maybe it's Instagram, maybe it's TikTok, who knows? But 
you need to try to find where your audience is uh, and then be putting the content out there as well. And video content is one of the great things. You can use it on multiple platforms. So it's all, shoot, yeah. yeah, you can be posting it on Instagram, TikTok, uh, Twitter, and YouTube at the same time. Maybe one platform performs better than the other and you start investing more time there. So it's really about testing, creating good content. And like you said, being it being something you enjoy. If you're forcing yeah. it, it's going to come across to the to the viewer in the end. You know, it's funny. Some someone uh, who I'd say is, I really look up to this person. They were talking about just you know content strategy on channels, and you know he's like, well, what do you think about these different channels? I'm like, well, I think YouTube is this, and Instagram is for these people. And he's like, how do you know? Like, how how are you possibly asserting such broad? And it really got me like thinking, like, you know what? I'm I'm so filled with my own experience, and maybe like the handful of people I've ever heard talking about this. He's like, you have no idea. And you don't even know what content's going to work on which I don't think this is the content for TikTok. This is the throw it all out there and let the data start showing you. I think that is, um, that was one of the eye openers for me because I think I've just been so almost as by osmosis, like convinced that TikTok is for these kinds of people, et cetera. And you kind of realize there's so many people on these things that um, it's like, it's impossible for one brain to know that's exactly how you, you kind of maneuver through them. Like it takes a lot of content, a lot of data to like start being able to make broad brush statements saying this content is much better for TikTok than YouTube and so on and so forth. So I that that to me it really rocked me when I heard that that person tell me this. Yeah, that makes sense. You have to remove the subjectivity. It has to be objective. And the only way to make it objective is to rely on what the data shows. Yeah. Which is by the way, and, and a lot of folks um, you know wonder about you know so the data i'm not a numbers person you know it's really hard honestly i've seen so, like i've seen people have a google sheets where they're recording data at the end of a week for huge channels like we're not even talking like i have you know 200 views i'm talking people are getting tens of thousands of views a week and they just have a master google sheet to just record there is not sort of a i need a lot of tooling and i need all of these kind of big platforms to manage it um, it can be really scrappy for a while and then, you know, maybe mandates you going out and tooling up all this stuff. Um, all right. Brett from Colorado. Um, my co-founder doesn't, doesn't work as hard as I do, but we're equal owners and co-presidents. I'm starting, it's starting to get to me. How do I fix this situation? <laughs> Uh, well, this is probably one of the biggest conflicts you're going to have in a partnership anytime. Uh, I mean, the first thing you should have done is make sure that you have a mechanism for dealing with that and the way the business is actually formed. If yeah, it's, cool. if it's too late now, then you're going to have to have open conversations about it. Uh, at the end of the day, it may be a better use of time, uh, or if everyone's time for someone to walk away. Uh, or maybe you have the conversation, the person actually realizes, uh, they're not putting in the effort, or maybe you find out they have other things going on in their life. They're taking more time from them. It's really about open communication. If you're already past the point where there's a, a mechanism to deal with this problem, but if you're not communicating what the issues are, you're never going to resolve them. I also, think it comes down to self-awareness. You know, this is a, this is the Brett's perception, right? This person's perception that they're not putting in their fair yeah. but you might ask this other person, there could be so many, like they think that they're working their heart out and it's the reverse, or they said, yeah, I actually think I'm not putting in as much as I should. And so, you know, until you can actually get some sort of real talk about this stuff and understand truly how this person sees their participation, a lot of it is just like your point of view, your, your, your mood at the moment. Um, and, and that can actually be really disempowering. So, and I think like to your point, yeah, of course, if you if you now come to the conclusion, perception or not, right, just whatever it is, you're, this is your belief, you don't have that mechanism. Um, it's actually just, it's so important to have those conversations. I've seen like infinity people, I like that. Um, just, you know, always think there's like a, some sort of a chess game to play. Like if you stealthily move around, you can kind of maneuver things. I find that that's um, an enormous amount of energy for a very, very high, hard to attain target, like to kind of, you know, Thomas crown affair your way out of a situation versus just like sitting down and kind of hashing it out because it's going to, it's not going to go away. And you, that's, you made a very good point. It is all perception. We don't know uh, how other people view their own work or how other people view their contributions. I have found myself many times frustrated with my partners uh, just to find out that they're just as frustrated with what's going on. 
So it, it is very, uh, it's very important to have these conversations. Yeah, uh, I agree. Um, it's hard though, honestly, like in heart, it sucks sometimes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because you're, you know, you're in your most vulnerable when you're, you know, possibly putting, you know, a little bit of sparks on the table and you don't know where it's going to go. Um, yeah. And I had to deal with this early on in my businesses. So, uh, we had to like, the first time I learned, I had to walk away from my business, uh, with a partner and we had to start a new business just cause like there was, it was a situation where he really wasn't putting in effort. And it was just like, you know what, this isn't worth it. And just kind of walk away. And unfortunately, if you're in a circumstance now where that's the option on the table, uh, you may just be better off taking it. Yeah, that is the, the, the walk away. Like, I mean, by the way, let's just assume that everything this person's saying is true. Um, and the other person is is putting in less effort. They know that. They also are going to know that if this that their co-president walks away, they don't have much of a business to run. Like, they're not going to be... So, yeah, actually, you know, if, if everybody's actually acknowledging the situation, um, you know, you realize that you don't have a, the, the most awesome, um, you know, alternative if the, the engine of the business leaves the business. Yep. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of sets it up for failure. So. Yeah. Um, okay. And then last, you know, last question here. So um, this was e-commerce specific. So Rachel from Texas is asking, um, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs looking to transition from having built companies in traditional retail to e-commerce and especially on platforms like Amazon? Uh, I would say you probably need to forget most of what you've learned. <laughs> um, I think, uh, so I, I, I didn't work on the retail side at Sears. I worked on the real estate side, but I had a pretty good uh, understanding of how the retail side worked. Traditional retail and brick and mortar does not translate well to e-commerce. Some of the yeah. concepts around merchandising exist, but merchandising on, online is completely then diff different than merchandising in store. What you're going to need to focus on when you're making this transition is, I mean, probably leaning into experts, but you're also going to need to focus that there's no foot traffic. People are not walking into your store. To, in, in lieu of that lack of foot traffic, you need to advertise, you need to market, you need to get your product out there. There's a variety of different ways to do it from SEO to paid advertising to content marketing. Uh, it's really figuring out where you want to invest your time and money to start getting the best results. Most of the time, it's usually in paid ads to start because SEO is a long game, content marketing is a long game. But what you've learned on the traditional retail side is really not going to apply online very much. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, it's also... There's, I think so many things that depend on the product itself, but, um, you know, one of the things is, is again about like, well, well why do they want to make this switch? Right. Because that motivation can mean so much because they feel like, you know, if, if you feel like you're more digitally like leaning and you're like, I operate better online, I can do things better. That's already a start of like, it probably is a better fit. But if the pleasure you got, you get out of retail is like, I love talking to customers. You know, I love the, the service relationships that I get with them. Um, you're, you're probably saying like, I know Amazon's bigger and I can sell more, but in theory, you're turning it, you're turning, you're, you're starting this motion, which is going to remove the very thing about your business that you got into. So I think like those are this, it's this mindset shift of, you know, are you set up for an online world more or less? Um, and then I would actually say it's, it's actually like study, study things to death. Like, you know, just like the brand liquid, liquid, death that you were talking, is it liquid death? Yeah. Liquid death. Yeah. Just like study all of the, the folks that have come and done this, right. There's probably hundreds of companies that have made that move. And I would just say like, reach out to them, right. People are really willing to talk sometimes and learn what their experience was like. I mean, talk to people like you, you know, like, there's so many people out there that don't have to make this a blind, like just walk down and, and hope you don't bump into something sharp. And I think that the more, if you have the ability to do that, it'll pay so much in terms of like, you know, pro avoiding black eyes um, for sure. you know, on the path. For sure. And I think uh, we've already talked about YouTube a little bit here, but I mean, YouTube is one of the best learning resources there are out there. I mean, I learned yeah. e-commerce through YouTube pretty much and Facebook. Uh, Facebook groups as well. It's another good way, but like, there's a lot of good resources out there. It takes a lot of time to dig into them, a lot of time to actually learn them. But yeah, the more informed you are, the better the decisions you're going to be able to make. And you're probably going to avoid a lot more of the pitfalls than you would have if you just made the jump from traditional retail to e-commerce. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. I love it. Um, Mike, thank you. This was great.
<laughs> I'm, I'm glad it was good. Thank you for having me.